Right, I think we'll start uh, uh, this symbolic seminar. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome here in Bordeaux Montaigne uh, Associate Professor Maino Akshir uh, from Manisa Chelal Bayar uh, University in Turkey. Maybe I should have written my name on there. <laughs> <laughs> we can add it quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my new actually is uh, is a graduate in English. Uh, she graduated graduated in two thousand five, uh, but since then she also finished her PhD, completed her PhD in twenty twelve, um, on the dis with a dissertation entitled "Manipurin Satire in Contemporary British Fiction." She's been lately working on violence um, as represented in contem in the context of contemporary British um, novel. And so today's topic, as you can see here, uh, is going to be um, on beauty, beauty myth, biopolitics. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to uh, give you the floor. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for having come so, um, so numerous this morning. Oops. Good. L'inter. No, l'interrupteur. Yeah, I can use this one. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to have such a big crowd as an audience, so thank you for... Hello. <laughs> thank you for um, being here. And uh, I was in one of your uh, seminars by Pascal uh, yesterday. And uh, I was also happy to see that what I'm going to talk about somehow aligns with what you are already familiar with. So we are going to be talking about grotesque, monstrosity, uh, but in a slightly different uh, aspect, from a different point of view. But it's interrelated. So I'm hoping to be able to offer you another view of what you have already been discussing. So I hope this is uh, going to be inspiring for you. So before I begin, let me ask you how many of you are familiar with uh, The Stone Gods by Jeanette Winterson? <laughs> That's going to be tricky, but we'll be fine. I mean, I, I will try to provide you with uh, the mainframe uh, of uh, the novel. And uh, our, the second question, are you familiar with the concept of biopolitics? I'm asking this to see if I should, you know, provide you with a comprehensive uh, explanation of it or just, you know, mention it. All right, we'll see. And uh, we can expand it in accordance with, you know, your interpretations or questions. So my topic today is... Um, is uh, you see, uh, indicated in the title, uh, the connection between uh, the concept of beauty, the understanding of beauty, and how it's shaped, how it's actually shaped uh, and uh, constructed by what Foucault originally calls biopolitics, or uh, he interchangeably uses it with uh, the concept of biopower, as well, which we will go deeper into that uh, later as we proceed. And you're familiar with uh, Keats, I believe, the British poet. So his Ode on a Grecian Urn. <laughs> I especially wanted to use his line in my title. So the question is, is truth beauty and beauty truth? And is it the only thing that we know and we need to know, right, as he finishes? his uh, widely read poem. Uh, it, does it have to be central to our existence? And how this central position of beauty, or how this beauty myth that infiltrates in our lives has become something um, fabricated by what we call biopolitics. So, uh, actually I would like to begin with the personal story of how I started working on this. Uh, it was last year, uh, right around the time when uh, the conflict between Israel and 
uh, Palestine uh, began. And of course, it was upsetting and shocking and you know frustrating all at once. And I had been, you know, interested in the concept of biopolitics for a long time then because I was already working on the concept of violence, but I never had enough time to, you know, go deeper into that. So I thought when the conflict began and it was rising higher and higher, like reaching into a climax, I thought it was the time to start reading more about this. Uh, because of the context, I of course began with uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who uh, used the concept as to revolve around another concept of his, that is Homo Sacer, the sacred human. Uh, this concept actually originates from the ancient Roman law, uh, and it's referred to a person who could be killed without the killing being referred to as homicide. So it's the killing of someone without consequences, without you know being rendered as murder, but it's not also some sort of a religious or sacred right. So, right? Uh, Agamben actually used this term to define the Jewish community uh, that was subjected to uh, genocide after, during the World War. Right? So ironically, things have turned the other way around, right? The, perfect, the victim of uh, history has turned into the uh, perpetrator. Anyway, so a person, according to Agamemnon's theory, uh, can be reduced to bare life in his terms, a life stripped of all rights, legal protection, or political significance. So it's, it's kind of normalization of exclusion and violence, even the killing. So after reading Agamben, I moved uh, on with uh, Hart and Negri, who are uh, other contemporary um, scholars that uh, focused on the concept. Especially in their book, Empire, it was a very controversial book uh, when it was first published in 2000, because uh, they also have the same frame of biopolitics, but they were saying that it is not necessarily such a good thing, such, such a bad thing, I'm sorry, but it also contributes to the uh, productivity and continuation of life, you know, so it was necessary. Such a control mechanism uh, that can be referred to as biopolitics is also necessary because it enables human cooperation, communication, creativity. And uh, it can also give rise to forms of collective resistance, alternative forms of social organization, which they refer to as the multitude and which was uh, the uh, central concept of their second book, Multitude, which came out in 2004. Um, then I decided to go back to the source, because the inspiration for both um, Agamben and Hart and Negri was, of course, Michel Foucault. So I started reading uh, Foucault's understanding of biopolitics, um, and uh, he first mentioned the term interchangeably with uh, biopower and discipline and punish. Then we see it in history of sexuality, madness and civilization, psychiatric power, uh, and the punitive society, which is one of the essays that uh, is in uh, lectures at the College de France. So, um, I have been reading all these and uh, thinking about how this elusive and subtle ideological, political mechanism infiltrates into our lives, shaping us, conditioning us, not only in macro-political ways, but also in like very slight, very personal uh, ways from very personal aspects. And uh, it was right about the time that my next Botox injection was approaching. <laughs> so, like, I'm 40, almost 41 now, and I 
felt that I needed to look, you know, younger, and you know, my skin needs to look fresher, and so on and so forth. So I, I uh, started to get the injections like three years ago or so. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, when you get the injection, you're supposed to sleep like sitting upright like this, because you cannot put any pressure on where you get the injection because the fluid under your skin can move around and you know you can make up looking like this <laughs> right so it needs to stay in the right place so you have to sleep sitting upright for three days and I was uh, in my bed not being able to sleep with my back hurting with my neck hurting thinking about biopolitics <laughs> and I was like why am I doing this to myself? What is wrong with me, right? What makes me think that I need this? And at that moment, everything fell into place, right? And I decided to think about this, write about this. So this work, this research was more than uh, just an academic interest for me. It was also... Um, uh, a process of self-discovery and I was trying to figure out what invisible forces were at play what was you know urging me to do, do this uh, so that is how I started uh, going deeper into this and I chose uh, Winterson's novel The Stone Gods uh, as an epitome of uh, this but before that I'm going to like very shortly talk about the theoretical uh, details about biopolitics. Uh, it can simply be defined, as you see on the projection, as the ways in which the political structures subtly uh, work in elusive ways to organize and control life through forms of power that Foucault also labels as biopower. So the fields of application of biopolitics can range from health, I mean we are having this crazy obsession about health, the way we're supposed to look, the way we're supposed to you know, feed ourselves, our children, you know. So everything is uh, super healthy, super, um, uh, you know, conditioned, I don't know how to put it. Uh, it can be applied to the field of birth rates, population diversity, so it's a wide range of areas that biopolitics is uh, applicable to. So it's basically a control mechanism that tempers with the individual's relationship with their own body. So the main field of uh, operation for biopolitics is the human body, our bodies. And uh, even the simplest aspects of our bodies are regulated by biopolitical by practices. And as a conclusion, we can be punished, we can be excluded, normalized, or things might be normalized, we can be disciplined or healed in accordance with uh, where we stand within the biopolitical atmosphere, right? If we fit in, then we are healthy, we are healed. If not, we are punished, excluded, right? And sometimes even acts of violence are normalized, right? For the sake of you know, public goodness, <coughs> public well-being, let's say. Um, so Foucault explains the historical process by arguing that from the 18th century onwards, there is a shift, there is a transformation from sovereign power to disciplinary power. So, from the 19th century on, especially, rather than the application of direct force, power starts working in more subtle ways, right? And this goes hand in hand with the institutionalization of prisons, schools, hospitals, mental institutions, and factories. And a panoptic world is established, founded. 
You're probably familiar with the concept homopticon. It's originally Jeremy Bentham's concept. It's his design for a, an ideal prism. So panopticon is a circular shape, right? The cells are situated on the circular wall, right? And there's a watchtower in the center. Uh, so the watchtower can see all the convicts, but none of the convicts can see what's on the watchtower, right? So even when there is no guard, on the watchtower, the, con the convicts al always assume that they are being watched, so they keep themselves open. So it's like self-censoring mechanism. And Foucault resembles the structure of the modern society to a panopticon. We are, it's a surveillance culture, you know. <laughs> Whenever you say shoe, some advertisement of a shoe comes up on your phones, right? So it's a surveillance culture, uh, and we are being watched all the time. Uh, so it's a crisis of democracy uh, on, on the very uh, basic level. Um. All right. And um, this uh, surveillance culture also goes hand in hand with uh, the transformation of our culture into, or of our societies into the societies of the spectacle, as Guy Debord, another French mid 20th century scholar or uh, philosopher, let's say, uh, argues. And he opens his book with the, the same name with a quote from Feuerbach, in which Feuerbach says, but for the present age, which prefers the sign to the thing signified. So the appearance, I mean, if you think of it in, in the Platonian sense, in the Platonic sense, let's say, uh, the world of ideas, the world of appearances. Plato says it's the real deal is the world of ideas, the <coughs> concept, the meaning. The appearance is on only a reflection, a projection, a lie, right? But in our world, it's the other way around, right? The sign, the appearance, is preferred to the thing that is signified. So the essence is nothing. It's the appearance that matters now. The copy to the original, representation to reality, appearance to essence, Feuerbach says. Truth is considered profane, and only illusion is sacred. Sacredness is in fact held to be enhanced in proportion as truth decreases and illusion increases. So that the highest degree of illusion comes to be the highest degree of sacredness. So our sacred is the illusion, the appearance in Feuerbach's terms. So it's the pseudo world of spectacles, according to Gide Bort, where even the deceivers are deceived. Uh, well, I, I don't keep saying quote unquote because it's already up there, right? So. This is a quote from uh, Gita Bort. So it's a world of deception that is driven by commodity fetishism. And as you know, the Bort argues, it's a form of schizophrenia, right? So what is presented, I mean, it, it should sound very familiar to you, especially in the age of you know, social media, right? Uh, what is presented as true life turns out to be a more truly spectacular life. And the realm of operation, the space that this uh, powers that are at play are applied to, this pseudo reality is basically the human body. Which Jeanette Winterson brilliantly uh, highlights, uh, opens into discussion in her The Stone Gods. Uh, actually, The Stone God is a science fiction novel. It's set in the future. 
So let me tell you about the main plot very briefly. Uh, so uh, the story is set in a, in a planet that is called Orbus. And uh, it's a very hierarchically uh, segregated community. There are the celebrities, there are the police force that is referred to as enchantment services, ironically. Uh, there are, you know, people of the spectacle <laughs> in the board concepts. They, they are, there are unknowns, like it's the case system, right? Very strict hierarchy. And the planet is dying. Uh, its resources have been wastefully destroyed. So it's unhabitable. It's about to be unhabitable. So the society, the people living there, they started looking for an alternative planet. And uh, surprisingly, the name of the planet is Planet Blue, which is an obvious reference to our world. So they are looking closer into the planet to see if it's habitable, the blue planet. And they realize that they are, there are dinosaurs there, like huge beasts, monsters. So they decide to digress a meteor from its regular path to make it crash the world, kill the dinosaurs, and then they have the, you know, the right environment to go there and settle, right? So it's, it's, it's a fairy tale about how life on Earth began with the extinction of the dinosaurs, right? It's a very, very brilliantly composed story. So, uh, the text revolves around a lot of discussions, a lot of topics, uh, which are like very worthy of uh, focusing on or highlighting. But I prefer to uh, focus on the political technology of the body uh, as represented in the novel in Foucault's terms that he puts in Discipline and Punish. Uh, so what we see uh, in the novel in terms of the political technology of the body is the subconscious conditioning of the members of this community into acting within specific, mostly self-destructive patterns of behavior that is normalized, legitimized, and People are made to internalize uh, these patterns by the imposition of a certain dis discourse, a promotion of the consumer culture, and a culture of hedonism that entails it. So, um, men in this community, I mean, everybody in the community, are going through macro DNA operations and they have something that they call genetic fixing. So the, the technology provides the opportunity to make people fix their age at, uh, at, at a certain point, right? When you're 20, you can genetically fix and you never age from that moment on, right? So it was a world where everybody is super young, everybody is super beautiful, right? And in such a world, men have turned into hedonistic pedophiles with straight sexual tendencies. And women, <laughs> uh, they subconsciously are conditioned to look like children to be able to serve this crooked male sexual fantasy, right? Winterson puts it saying, like, uh, now that everyone is young and beautiful, a lot of men are chasing girls who are just kids. They want something different when everything has become the same. So there's this celebrity character called Little Senorita. She is uh, like the most outstanding epitome of this crazy, uh, crooked obsession of uh, you know how they look, image, appearance. She's a 12-year-old 
pop star. I mean, she's not 12 years old, but she looks 12. Because she fixed when she was 12 years old. Uh, rather than getting older or losing her charms in the eyes of men, or losing her fame, she preferred to freeze herself in time to keep the fame and the allure, you know? And she has become a sex icon at the age of 12. So, sexuality is one of the core concepts in that respect. And as Foucault also argues, it's almost always a very political concept, right? Um, so, through her representation of sexuality, uh, Winterson highlights how biopower puts hold upon the body, how biopower invests the body, invests in the body, trains the body, tortures it, force it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs, as Foucault uh, highlights. So the, the, the field of desire becomes a field of power, or like they uh, overlap. And uh, Thomas Lemke, one of the scholars of biopolitics, uh, he uh, evaluates this as the body turning out to be a molecular software that can be read and rewritten, right? So the body, the human body, is no longer an organic essence, but it's something that can be read, worked on, rewritten, reshaped, right, in accordance with the necessities of uh, the culture. <coughs> so this, the community that is represented in Winterson's novel is a community of routine cosmetic surgery and genetic fixings. Like these are normal procedures. And if you don't do these to yourself, you are considered abnormal, grotesque, and monstrous, right? So it's a topsy-turvy world, a world inside out. And in that respect, we should also revisit Foucauldian concept of, I mean, I'm so sorry for if I, I'm not able to pronounce this right, but Hopital General. <laughs> Is it, does it sound good? <laughs> okay. So the Hopital General uh, is not a medical establishment anymore, according to Foucault. It's rather a semi-judicial structure. I mean, if you don't fit in the imposed standards of health, of beauty, of appearance, then it judges you. I mean, if you, you're not within the limits of, you know, the ideal size, then you are marginalized, judged, excluded, right? Uh, so, according to Foucault, it's one of the most efficient institutions of the operation of biopolitics, and it is utilized for the regulation of the community and the imposition of the standards of normality at the cost of individual uniqueness and liberty. So maybe this explains why everyone is beginning to look like each other nowadays, right? When you take a look at the profiles on your Instagram, like, it's the same face, male or female, right, that you see, because that's the standard, that's the normal, and if you're out of it, then you are the deviant body, as Foucault, again, puts it. So in that respect, the doctors are the priests of the body now. And there is more. <laughs> more is an organization that does the regulating in the novel. I mean, it's the name of the organization, More. So it's very natural for a community which, you know, always asks for more and more and more. So it's the, also the name of the institution, and this institution uh, is actually a private investment, but it acts as if it was the government, right? 
So it regulates the operation of the society and it keeps people somehow occupied and worried about their appearances in such obsessive levels that no one cares about anything else. So somehow this institution paralyzes people by getting them obsessed about their appearances. So much so that, as Winterson uh, says, no one wanted to talk about the issues, the issues, which are actually very pressing issues because, you know, the planet is dying. Uh, but no one cares. No one even knows about it. Um, to talk about genetic fixing, which is one of the uh, ways in which uh, this normal appearance is enabled, uh, it's a fictional medical interruption of one's process of maturation, so it stops you from aging. And Podgajna, one of the scholars that published on the novel, renders this as oscillating between technological dream and nightmare. Technological dream because it's one of the archetypes, right? From Gilgamesh on, human beings have been looking for ways to reach immortality, right? So it's one of the deepest archetypal desires that we have, but it turns into a nightmare uh, in reality and in the novel. Uh, because it turns into a kind of a self-inflicted violence. Uh, and this process has become so natural to these people that they no longer celebrate their birthdays, but they rather celebrate their G days, genetic fixing days, G days. All right. So, this uh, macro surgery operations are the new monster in that respect, right? Um, the human body becomes an object of sight, a mere spectacle as a result of this. And celebrities, uh, like they, they feel like they have to take this even further because this is a world where everybody already looks perfect. So they have to, you know, go one step further to look even more perfect. Um, so they take it to such a level that they turn into grotesque figures with their bio-enhanced bodies and color-changing hair to fit their clothing, right? As Winterson puts it, their boobs smell like beach balls and their clicks go up and down like beach umbrellas. They are surgically stretched to be taller and steroids give them muscle growth that turns them into star gods. Their body parts are bio-enhanced. Their hair can do clever things like change color to match their outfits. They are everything that science and money can buy, which are obvious institutions of uh, biopolitics. Um, so, in the Foucauldian frame, such bodies are referred to as dynastic bodies. So such bodies become multipliers of power. Uh, they turn out to be bodies that enable the sustainability of the existing system, the status quo, right? That is why these are zones, these bodies are zones in which power is most concrete and intense, as Foucault puts in the punitive society, and these are dynastic bodies. So I'm not sure if this is a coincidence or not. Uh, I suppose, I assume, Winterson knows Foucault, knows his work, but I'm not sure if she is aware of this specific uh, concept of dynastic bodies, but she also refers to this uh, community as the DNA dynasty. Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it was intentional, I'm not sure. 
So these dynastic bodies linger on the verge of the grotesque with their translucent bodies. Well, this is also from Winterson. I forgot to put quotation marks in here, sorry. Men looking like golden retrievers, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Because of, like the golden hair, the tan face, you know, the square jaws. Uh, women looking like giantesses with impressive breasts with two extra mouths where one would normally expect to see nipples. So three mouths, two mouths in the place of nipples. And all this grotesque appearance is justified through this course, specifically through a weird reappropriation of the term of or concept of democracy. So it's it's a personal decision, it's democratic, so everybody can get to do that to themselves, right? Uh, so it's it's um, ironic actually, right? Something that is very undemocratic because if they, these operations were done under the influence of this biopolitical impositions, but they are justified as being democratic decisions made by the individuals, right? All right. Okay, so in this grotesque world, which is the normal, there are also deviant bodies, right? The people who refuse to fit in the imposed system. They don't want to genetically fix, they don't want to go through the uh, DNA modifications, right? And uh, they are marginalized, judged, and punished. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of a biopolitical selection, like the unconditional selection, right? Uh, and they are rendered as the deviants, as uh, in Agamemnon sense, they are the homo sacer of this world. So they don't get to live as the others, right? Their lives don't matter at all. Um, so one, one uh, incidence of this exclusion, this marginalization is seen uh, in the process of choosing who is, the, who, who is to move to the blue planet and who is to remain in orbit. So not everyone is to be taken to this new planet to start a new life. So only the rich, the elite of the community are to be taken to the blue planet and the others are going to be left to die with, along with the planet Orbis, right? So this is the first epitome of this biopolitical selection. And some power structure decides who gets to live and who gets to die. Um, we also see uh, a conflict, an intense conflict between conformists, like people who fit in, and the dissidents. Uh, Billy Crusoe, very remarkable name, uh, she is the central character of the novel, and uh, she is one of the dissident characters that are rendered as deviant, uh, deviances, right? And she is constantly being judged, harassed for being eccentric. He is judged, sorry, she, it's a she, I'm sorry. In Turkish, we have no distinction between he, she, so. I might sometimes confuse the two. Uh, so she is judged for writing in a notebook rather than using a speech pad. She is judged, uh, harassed for living in a farm. She is judged by consuming natural food, which is seen as dirty and diseased. So she is an outcast in this community, right? And she is labeled as deviant, as a monster, and as <coughs> Winterson ironically says, monsters are to be humanely destroyed. Which brings me, uh, to my mind the distinction that we made yesterday between hum, inhuman, inhumane, right? 
Uh, so these monsters, these deviant bodies, should be humanely destroyed. How ironic. So this is a world that is rather repressive, corrosive, and anti-democratic in Winterson's terms. Am I taking like more time than I'm supposed to? Okay, great. All right. of the fact that there is no chance of survival outside the system. Uh, the characters are com these characters are completely pushed uh, out of the system. They are the unknowns. Um, so when you become an unknown for an act of dissidence or you know not agreeing to uh, fit in, your papers are destroyed, so you have no identity, no ID. You're not registered in the system anymore. All your assets, accounts, frozen. You cannot travel. You cannot even buy a simple thing for yourself. You can use no money, nothing. You're just, you become a nobody. So, this is defined as going back to a fairy tale. Defeat the dragon and be offered the kingdom, in Winterson's words. So pacify the deviants, fight the deviant, and the order is restored. Uh, Winterson defines the unknowns as, you see them sometimes cleaning the streets, they are taggers flashing at 15 minute intervals, so you cannot hide that you are an unknown, because there's a tagger like shining, indicating that you're an unknown, so that no one touches you, no one approaches you. Checked and recorded by the satellite system that watches us more closely than God ever did. So it's impossible to avoid this panoptic system, panoptic mechanism, because every single detail about an individual is stored in a chip that is infiltrated into your wrist. Uh, so all the information concerning that specific person uh, or the, their location can be accessed anytime if the authorities the more uh, feels necessary. And well, so um, the novel has a complicated plot structure. It goes back and forth in time, right? So at one point, we jump to further future. After the Third World War, which was uh, a nuclear war, obviously. And uh, at this point in the novel, uh, Winterson tells us about the toxicated people of the post-war post era. Uh, they are pushed away to live in the forest. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the forest in English, the word, comes from a Latin word that originally means outside. So they are literally pushed outside the system. They are made to remain in the forest. And they are toxic radioactive mutants, basically. And helicopters drop food to the forest so that these mutants won't walk to the city and you know get in touch with other people. So these are the people who are rendered as disposable homo sacers. And they are the deviants of the rotten forest. And Winterson defines them in uh, the projected quotation up there. Coming, coming in ragged, torn, ripped, open wounded, ulcerated, bleeding, toothless, blind, speechless, stunted, stunted, mutant, alive. They were the bomb damage, the enemy collateral, the ground kill, blood poisoned, 
lung punctured, limb swollen, skin like dirty tissue paper, yellow eyes, wheel bodied, frog mottled, postules oozing thick stuff, mucus faces, bold, scarred, scared, alive, human. Uh, so they are represented as the victims, the outcast victims of regrettable, unavoidable, a war to end all wars, a war for democracy, a war for freedom, peaceful war that distinguishes who gets to live and who <coughs> is to die. This is also, you know, uh, an obvious reference to the refugees, you know, they're being kept outside the system, in camps. All right. So to conclude, uh, what I've been trying to focus on today, or in my research, is how biopolitics elusively or subtly operates through even the most intimate, uh, there's a typo there, fields of our lives, how it surrounds penetrates and works on bodies, and how the body in that respect is reduced to be a spectacle, an object of sight, a surface to be penetrated, and a volume to be worked on, in Foucault's words. Winterson portrays a world where individuals are so paralyzed through their obsessions, with their appearances, and how they're imposed uh, with a specific standard of beauty. Uh, in this context, the body is made into an object of control, regulation and man manipulation, and people are uh, compelled to conform to a narrow set of standards of beauty. And they are pacified through this imposition. So the novel also highlights the consequences of non-conformity, deviation from the imposed societal norms, which range from exclusion to several different forms of punishment. And uh, of course, this is a fictional narrative, but it has a lot of references, direct, obvious references to a lot of things that are experienced in the real world by all of us, uh, from the refugee crisis to COVID-19 restrictions that we thankfully left behind a couple of years ago. So the novel urges the readers to turn a critical eye towards the operation of biopolitics in our own lives. Uh, this is an era, this is a time which is marked by the manipulation of bodies, which is an era that is marked by an obsession with appearances, obsession with the spectacle, commodification of identity, and the song that in that respect serves as a reminder of the importance of preserving the individual agency and uniqueness and authenticity, right? In the face of biopolitical control, and the seductive allure of the spectacle. So this is the end of my speech. Uh, here are my references. If you're interested, I can share the slideshow with you. This is about to be published in two weeks or so. I can also share the article for the ones who are interested and for the ones who want to you know, look further into it. So if you have any questions or comments, maybe I should hand the microphone to... Oh, that works too. Okay. Thank you very much.